Oh my goodness, do we have the most epic guest. And in fact, we had the luxury pleasure of getting to watch her speak on stage. And we just coined her Neiman Marcus because of the grace, the poise, the luxury, the beauty. Her brand not only reflects it, but the mark she makes on the world. It's just undeniable. So we are so excited to have you here, Miss Kelly. Thank you so much for joining us. My gosh, thank you so much for having me. I'm just honored to be here with you guys. Yeah. So Kelly, you're the author of Scissors Make Sense. You are near and dear to my heart as a hairdresser who has also transitioned out to start coaching, hosting retreats, masterminds, to be able to help support those moving into the industry that we once loved so much. So our stories connect and our souls really lock in when it comes to the hair journey. So I guess the best place to start is how did you choose hair? Because if you're anything like me, you didn't go to college and do what your parents told you to do. So what does your journey look like into the hair world? And how did you, how did it evolve to here? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because I always say hair found me. I'm not one of those girls that was like, I've always dreamed of making people beautiful and doing hair. I was a theater major in high school and I decided that I was going to go to college for theater. So I did that for about a year and a half and realized that the world of college theater and high school theater were very different. Um, but I come from a large family of artists in various different capacities. And so seeing color and art was always easy for me. So I actually ended up in makeup from theater school and worked in makeup for a little while. I went to hair school just to get credentials. Um, but as you know, going through the apprenticeship, I ended up with a few clients and long story short, it was like five clients turned into 10, turned into 20, turned into 40. And then the next thing I knew I was a hairstylist. And at this point in my career, I can't imagine doing anything else. I mean, it's just been such a beautiful career, but it is kind of funny. Some days I wake up and I'm like, wow, what, what led me here? <laughs> That's so cool. And I love that you were just following that next piece of the puzzle and it led to something only you could look back with hindsight. It's very often that that happens when you just don't know where you're going, especially if you follow that intuitive call, which it seems based on your branding and our conversations in person, it seems like you are quite intuitive and you trust that inner nudge. So would you say that's what was leading you all those years ago? I think so. And a lot of times when people do ask me like how I got to where I am today, I have never been someone that's like, here's my big picture goal. I have always been like, here I am today. Here's what I've accomplished. What could I do next? And it's interesting that when you look back, you notice how far you've come. But I never, I never set out to open up a hair salon. I just kind of did. And then that, you know, one by one, each little thing opened the door to the next. And I'm just one who will always say yes to it and give it a try. Um, so yeah, it's just been really cool how it's evolved. There's something so important that a lot of people skip out on is that when you talk to successful people, anytime we get in, anytime I'm with a successful person in person, you can automatically tell because they're not so much head in the clouds, they're head down, let's do the work. Mm -hmm. And if you continuously focus on just producing really good work on the day to day, it's almost like it does just kind of take care of itself. If you keep your head in the clouds all the time, when you're with a client, they know that. They're like, why aren't you here? Why is there such a disconnect? Like, I don't feel the love. I don't feel the energy, which means I'm not going to be your client anymore. And I think it's so important for people to start to realize that if you'll do great work on whatever it is you're doing, even if it's not the exact thing that you plan on doing for the whole rest of your life, so what? Start doing it. If your partner's like, well, I don't know if I'm going to be with this person my whole life. So what? Give them the hundred percent. Like just put yourself in there. What I want to ask you is when did you start to figure out that what you, not only what you're doing is working and that other people aren't doing it quite as well as you are understanding the process. When did you decide, I want to start teaching people how to do this? Like, what's well, the thought process if I'm doing it now, but okay, I've got it. I'm going to position myself so that I can start telling people like, Hey, there's a way there's a, there's a method to all this. Like how, wh where did you make that decision? What was going through your head? Yeah. So in 2012, I actually entered and won a big major contest um, that allowed me to learn under some of the industry's greatest. And from that, I got some opportunities to teach hair color for other companies. Um, but what was interesting is I would go in and teach their curriculum, which was already pre-planned. Um, and at the end of it, there'd be a QA and a about, you know, color formulations, but they would always ask me how I was running my business or what I would do with certain client situations. And I found myself already answering this. And I remember thinking, thinking, you know, of all the salons that I went into, it was very rare that I walked away feeling inspired by someone. It was more that I felt like I was giving. And I realized that there was just this need for this information. So it started as I was just going to create a small little ebook that I thought, okay, that I can put this all together, put it out in the world and anybody who's interested in it could download it. But of course that 
you know, evolved all the way into the actual book and the book being published, which um, that led to people having more questions. So I was answering their questions, doing some one-on-one -on -one work. It just naturally kind of evolved that way, but people were already seeking me out for the information. What made you decide to write a book? Because there's so many different modalities in which you can share your knowledge. What, how did you get drawn to the writing aspect of it? Yeah, I think the idea was just like, wow, there's a lot of people who need this. So I was looking for a vehicle at the time that was something I could put together and give to a large group of people. I wasn't really aware of the online space and coaching at that time. Um, I kind of wish I would have been because I think starting earlier, you know, I'd be further along, but it was just all that I knew at the time with the resources that I had. Um, so I was just thinking ebook and, you know, it's a long story short, I was in a bad marriage and he kind of like made fun of the first project. And so when that relationship ended, I sought out a client of mine who's a writer and, um, she's, she's a ghostwriter. And she was like, you know, I could help you with this project and we could turn this into a real book. And I know publishing and, you know, we can get it published. And I was like, wow. Okay. And so it really was kind of a big middle finger up to the person who made fun of the original project. And I just love that now where it's like this, like, look at me now, you know? And, um, yeah, so it just was something that kind of evolved on its own. Yeah, I feel like it's such a beautiful story to kind of full circle it back and be like, look, look at what I've done. And I also think that you were exactly in the right place at the right time because ebooks at the probably of the time of publishing ebooks and that digital vibe was the new rage and all that was that was it. So you were probably even at that time at the forefront of what's next, how can I get this message out there? And that's ultimately what led me from out behind the chair is how can I share this message of empowerment? more than just four or five clients at a time. Cause like, this is fun and all, but like, I think the world needs to hear this. So I just love that, um, writing and you had that person show up. And I think that's a testament to following your passion yet being flexible and open to receiving the help that shows up when you've literally unconsciously or even consciously been asking for it. So that's, that's a beautiful approach. And it shows so much of that feminine intuitive side. But what I really love about you is that you are all things practical percentages, profits, numbers. And that is so far from my sparkles and colors approach to life. So I want to kind of talk about that balance that you bring to business. Is that also what separates you as a leader is because you can trust your intuition, but yet you're like, but what do the numbers say? Yeah, I think so. You know, I've always been that way in school. I liked mathematics and grammar because they were always, you know, factual. It wasn't something I was terrible at literature and having to figure out symbolism and things like that. And they would always say there's no wrong answer, but damn, if I didn't get the wrong answer, you know, so I just like things that are a matter of fact. So I've always enjoyed that side of it. However, you know, I think the piece that really ties into the coaching is that I am someone who's very giving and I like to give and I like to help. And I feel like whenever I am presented information, it's my responsibility to pass that forward. Um, and so that's really what I've done. So even though I have that as more of something that I'm interested in and entertained by kind of sitting down and figuring out numbers, there's also this other side of me that feels like that feminine side where it's like, I want to share this so that everybody can have access to it. Uh, you know, it's so beautiful because I feel like when we hit the right balance of things, it's when things start clicking. I think when we play just in our either our strength or the thing that we really enjoy a lot, we miss out. Uh, so many people won't dabble in that side that they're not. Pro and if you're not prolific, find somebody. There are so many people out there who will teach you, who will show you the ropes, who love it, who love numbers. I remember when I listened to Michelle talk. Michelle loved the numbers. It was so interesting because I think when you presented, you had such a way of presenting where it made things seem very simple. It's like, no, there's, you stop looking at every metric in the world. Like there's certain metrics that matter and make sure that you are looking at those. As you have continued to be around entrepreneurs and where do you think that people who are beginning or people maybe in that middle stage where they want to scale a little more, what mistake are they making? Like, what's the big thing that you're seeing? Are they not paying attention to something? Are they being blindsided by something? Like, what is that? Yeah. You know, I think the biggest thing is, you know, there's embarrassment or shame around what they don't know. So they don't want to admit that to someone else. And that's why, you know, I kind of made a joke in that presentation that you guys saw where it was like, I'm going to teach you like you're five years old. Like, I'm not going to assume, you know, anything. Some of this may be a refresher and some of it may be brand new because I think a lot of times money guru people go in with a lot of assumptions and they start using terminology and they've already lost their audience because they don't even know the terminology, but they're too embarrassed to, to speak up.
then I think there's a lot of confusion. So a lot of times people are using programs like QuickBooks and they're tracking their spending after the fact when really what they should be doing is making a plan before. And so a lot of times what they're doing wrong is they really don't know where their money's going. It's just they see it come in and they see it go out, but they're missing that key critical step of taking the money and making an, a plan for it before they spend it. Um, and I can't tell you many times when I'm teaching budgeting that a salon owner will say to me, isn't that like my QuickBooks? And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not. You know, this is what you're going to do before you spend, whereas your QuickBooks is what you're going to do after your spend. Um, so I think, you know, they don't teach us this stuff. You know that, Brittany, in hair school. I mean, business and finance is not something they teach. So we're really just going off of whatever money stories our families or previous employers or even friends have shared with us without really just understanding, you know, the factual information. Yeah. I love that you really t hone in on the financial side of creating freedom in your business and not like balayage and more shadow roots. That's fun, but this is really what's going to make or break you as an artist. So as much as people do feel shame or um, uncomfortableness in talking around this topic, I think giving an inside sneak peek behind the scenes really helps to kind of showcase that there are different ways of approaching business um, beyond just having a QuickBooks. One of the things that my friend, Natalia Benson suggested is that we go on money dates and every week you sit down, you talk about the money, where is it going, all of that. So what does a sneak peek look like into your relationship with money and how you have those dates or how you show up and assess? Is that a daily, a monthly, a quarterly? Like a, I just give it to my CPA, who cares? I know that's not your answer, but what does it look like behind the scenes for you and how you manage show up and have that relationship with money? I love that you say a money date because I say the same to my owners. I'm like, take yourself to lunch, get your laptop out, a glass of wine, like make it fun. Don't make it something that you dread. So if there's a, a new restaurant you've been wanting to try, go because you can fill that time by working on your budget. I really like to sit down at the first of the month and take the previous month's revenue and budget that out. So your monthly date is going to be a little bit more involved. And then I like having, you know, throughout the, throughout the month, every week, you could do it as just a little coffee date with yourself, but you're sitting down and really like categorizing everything, making sure it's lining up and then reconciling to make sure, you know, if you let that go on too long and there is a mistake somewhere in the budget, it just takes longer to find it. So if you want to make it easy on yourself, you know, I say have that weekly date um, to just make sure that everything is correct, entered correctly and reconciled. Um, for, for people who maybe even don't own their own businesses, but want to do something like this in, in their like personal lives, do you have any like software that you recommend or any kind of like books that really jump out and say like, if I were starting over, if I were doing this from scratch, I would at least start here. W what would that might be? Scissors yeah. makes <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But I do use a software program. I use a program. It's called YNAB and it stands for you need a budget. Um, and I did start this. A friend of mine way back in the day, like taught it to me. She used it at home, taught me how to use it at home. Once I had success with it, I applied it to my business. The thing that I like about that program, and there are others out there, if you don't want to use that specific one, um, is that it is all web-based and app controlled. So if you're out and about and, you know, especially salon owners, we go to salon centric to pick up something and then you realize there's a sale on leaders and you're like, oh, I should stock up because it's on sale. You now have all of the information in the palm of your hand. And if you don't have money in that category, you maybe don't need that back stock right then and there just because it's on sale. Um, so that's a great tool and you can use it personally as well. I love that. I think it's great for your personal life. I think it's great for anybody who's independent, anyone who owns a team. Um, and the one thing that I love about that program is they have a really extensive um, YouTube channel full of tutorials. So there are books out there for sure. But if you're going to use a program um, that's online based, they not only give you technical training, but they also give you money training as well on how to extend and enhance the life of your money. I think she just crushed my shopper spirit. It, I was like, but it's on sale, Kelly. How could you say no to the leaders? <laughs> uh, she, but but there, there's a there's a really important underlying underlying theme right there. Discipline here. is in that is that I know a lot of really talented people who make a ton of money and who have none. Yeah, they're just broke as a joke. And I know some people who have. I mean, if if they were gifted a wing and a prayer, they would still have barely enough talent to make it by, and they are swimming in dollars. And it's because they understand something that's different. 
they understand that it's not always just talent or it's not always the way you look or it's not always Instagram followers. It's how you perceive money and then what you do with it. Your idea of percentages for everything and saying like, well, if that if that bucket that I've deemed this amount, if, if this over, I'm not spending money there. That's not happening this month. We can wait till next month, maybe. We can wait till next quarter, but it's not happening. And I have seen people growing up that have had these same kind of buckets and the percentage model laid out and they kill it. I mean, like how well they're always doing. And it seems like they've masterminded it all. It's because they have. I mean, having a financial plan laid out more than just like I get money and I spend it, having even something a little bit more than that, a software, a book, a strategy, a something makes you the puppet master. I mean, you finally feel like in control of your destiny. I feel like there's so many people who who do not understand money whatsoever. And it's so weird because there's an entire section in every single book store for money and finance. Everyone I've ever been into has a thick section of people with PhDs and all sorts of crap. And it's wild that we don't like, this is, has to be something that's intimate. You have to love it. You want it to massage it. You want to feel, you want to dance with money. This is not something that you should shun away and be like, I don't know about that. That's scary. Like, it's not. It's like the hot girl. Go up and have a conversation. She's a person too. Like, just say, hey, you look beautiful. Like, shit, you know, like, and we have those conversations with money, we change our lives. And I think that so many people are only wanting to rely on talent and how much work they can output. And that never leads to a better financial future. It's nice to have, to, I love talent, I love being good at things, but if you don't have a strategy, it literally does not matter. And you will just continue to go down no matter how high you rise. It's just one of those weird truths. Yeah, so it's, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, you know, and I think a lot of times people think of it as really restrictive. And I always say in the beginning, you may feel restricted because change is uncomfortable. So if you're changing a habit that you've been doing into something that is more thought out and planned, it's going to be uncomfortable because it's a change in what you're doing. But in the end, you are going to actually have so much more freedom and control. And I always use an example. I have two examples that I use. Number one is when I was married, you know, you look and the idea is your money should start stacking up. So we would be, you know, in our relationship and he would look at the bank account and I'm making these numbers up, but let's say there was 10, $20,000 in the checking account and he had used all of his eating out money. And he was like, oh, I just want to go to Chick-fil-A tonight or something. And I'm like, well, we're out of money in that category. Where do you want to take it from? And he's like, but we have money in the bank. And I'm like, we do, but this is Christmas. This is vacation. This is this. Where do you want to take it from? Do you want to take it from our son's Christmas? And he's like, well, no, that sounds silly, right? You start really thinking about is it worth it to go get, you know, fast food when it means taking from your summer vacation or taking? And that's why we give every dollar a job. But the other example I was going to use is like, it's very different as a salon owner. Like, let's say my washing machine breaks and either way, I'm going to have to go into the store and buy a new washing machine. I can start pulling. I've got the account balance, but it's going to stress me out because I don't know where that money's coming from. Or if I just simply put $100 a month away every month and I build up this fund, when I walk into that store, I walk in with pride. Either way, I have to buy it. But now I'm walking in with this feeling of like, I did this. I saved for this. There's dollars now standing there with their hand up, like, pick me, pick me. I've been waiting to be used. And you go in and you can buy something joyfully. And that's the piece that brings the freedom is knowing that when you have chaos or something happen in your day to day, because it's going to happen, it's always going to happen to know that you are fully prepped and planned. It takes, it, it puts a whole different spin on the energy when you walk in to buy that thing. Yeah, I was just thinking it shifts the feeling around how you spend money. We're all spending money. And whether you do that in chaos or comfort is your choice. And I think that having that plan really gives you that, like, I I know where this is coming from. I know I can make more of it. And I think also you saying that money has a job, you know, like they, we, or however you phrase that, it made me think of this phrase that I've always lived by is that money likes movement. So for me as an, ener you know, thinking of in terms of energy, everything doesn't want to be stagnant. It likes a job to do, if you will. And so I always like to think of like, I'm calling in money to go to this experience. Like, so when people talk about manifesting more money, now there's a whole line and structure. Where is it coming from? What are the avenues in which you receive money? All of that has to be put in place. But once all those channels are there and you're in that more advanced level, like got it set up, now I'm calling in that next level abundance. I think that using that idea of like money likes movement and getting really specific on like 10K is gonna go to this program to help me up-level this 
new talent or skill. And that's kind of like giving your money a job. So it knows like, I need this for this. We need this for our organic groceries. You know, I, it, it really can, it can be a fun experience, especially who I'm like feeling like you're calling me out when you talk about like no plan beyond just make it and spend it. Cause I'm like, yeah, but it's worked for almost 40 years. So thanks. But I do understand that if there's scalability, um, there has to be structure. So what would you say is the biggest, um, hang up that people have when it comes to scaling, when they have to start moving their money around where they do have to start putting structure in place, where do people uh, get hung up on that? Well, I think they just don't think big picture of like, like kind of foreshadowing what's to come. I mean, this, the simple, you know, example we just did was like, you know, at some point, especially as a salon owner, that something's going to break. So it's kind of foreshadowing that. Um, and even in personal life, it's like, we always stress out Christmas, but you know, Christmas is coming. It comes every single year. So you might as well plan for that. And I think that's where the scalability can come as well is just knowing, you know, setting that goal of how much money do you want to set aside to invest? How much money do you want for retirement, for an investment account, for whatever it is you want in whatever areas you want your money to grow. But I agree with you too, about the money coming in and out. I can't remember who told me, but it's like the open hand analogy. So like if I have a hundred bucks and I just hold it really tightly because I don't want to let go. I, I don't allow any more money to come in my hand. Whereas like, if I keep that open and maybe that flows out, something else is going to flow in really nicely. And so we don't want to be, you know, too far one way or the other. We don't want to be overspending without goals, but we also don't want to put so much away that we're really, you know, tightly holding on and we're not even allowing ourselves to be open to other things that are coming our way. Her huh. balance is sexy. I know it makes so it, <laughs> you make, I love it because you make it make so much sense. You know, it just, it has this, like, it, you're like, yep, yep. You should have been doing it that way. You know, it has, <laughs> it has that like, yeah, she's not right. I mean, she's not wrong. It's just like, that's wow. Um, but I want to talk about one other aspect. We talked about how successful people and people who sustain wealth over time have a strategy for it. Mm -hmm. There's another common theme that I see come up a lot. And I see this come up a lot with you as well. And that is, knowing the importance of investing in your own growth. Mm -hmm. And just like you offer services to people to help them go up quickly. I mean, that's, when, when you get a formula, when you have a person who knows what they're doing and you can kind of tap into their world and see like, just like I said, you're like, damn, that really just made sense. Why? I'm sure I'm, I'm glad I shortcutted that. What is the importance of the growth aspect for you? Because as we all know, as you get up in business and as you get better and better coaches, as you go to nicer retreats, the, the, the pay scale goes up. So you're, you know, it's, you're coming out of pocket. You're, you're seeing that wall go damn. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, it makes such a difference in your life. Can you talk a little bit about that and your yeah. journey through investing in the importance and kind of what it's done for you and your business? Yeah. I mean, it's been everything for me. I mean, that's, it's just aside from taking money out of it, you know, and I think that's the big thing is that a lot of times people invest and they feel like there has to be a monetary re return on that investment. I've put $20,000 in programs that I never saw $20,000 back. However, who I was on the other side of that, the healing work that I did, the trauma work that I did, who I am as a person, how I show up as a leader, all of those things have huge major returns that money just cannot buy. Um, and I'm living a more happy, free life because of it. Now, when I do show up as a better leader and a better example and a better hair artist or whatever it is. I make more money. So I think sometimes we think if I put in 20,000, I've got to get 40,000 back. It doesn't always work that way. You have to really look at it and manage the expectations of like, what am I looking to get out of this? And so I strongly, strongly believe sometimes it's like, I need to learn a skill set. So I'm going to invest in, learn that skill. That skill will eventually make me money. It could be that I need to heal some things in, you know, from my past. And it could be that I need to learn how to manage my money better so that I do make more money. I mean, there's various different things, but um, I strongly believe that if you want to, you know, be somewhere, you've got to go to the people who are where you want to be, put yourself in the room and learn from them. I absolutely agree. And it's, you know, exactly why you and I do this work that we do. Not only do we hold space for others, but we also continue to invest in our growth and our connections. And it, it is the most beautiful thing because what you start to realize is that it's a collaboration effort. It's not competition anymore. And I think that 
really putting yourself, like you said, in the room with people who are going through it, kind of reflect back to you where you're at on your journey. And if you are investing in your business world, you better guarantee you're going to pull up all the shadows of your inner trauma and child inner childhood wounds that come up. Because I always say wherever your shadow is, it will show up in business. And so uh, it's it made me laugh when you said investing 20K, hoping to get 40 back, but instead I got like inner child healing. Like maybe we just have to really think of about investing in ourselves in more capacity than just getting that financial return, but also we're investing in our healing so that we can open up energetically to receive even more of. And that's so beautiful that you've shared this journey of like, I thought I was investing in my business, but instead I invested in my healing that then invested into my business. It's such a beautiful journey and synonymous. You cannot bypass your spiritual healing and just have this like fantastic bank account and business. Like it will show up on your shadows will show up friends <laughs> yeah no doubt I, I also talking about how you spend time what you spend dollars on what how does the balance look for you and as you get more things in your business as you have a book as you have coaching as you add masterminds as you as you add all these extra thing on it, it's it's a little bit different than i do hair behind the chair I mean, there's so many more, I mean, there's a lot of balls to juggle. I, I know because we've definitely lived that life and you're, you know, you're moving from one event to the next, you're going from one client to the next. It's, it's happening only really fast. How do you balance that out with your self-care? Cause we figured out, I mean, especially with hairstyles, self-care is just one of the most important things that exists. And just like we're talking about the biggest investment you can make is always in yourself. I mean, the, the, the cool thing about me is I'm here my whole life. I mean, this is, I'm not going anywhere besides where I'm at. And so when you invest in that, it just, it pays back in so many dividends. So what does that balance look like for you? Cause I know that as it gets up, it can, it can heighten the stress levels, the emotional levels can, and it can play into our relationship. So how does that look for you? Yeah. You know, I think for me, the biggest thing, and like one of the biggest areas of self-care that I do is delegation and people, I think, you know, they instantly think bubble baths, pedicures, you know, for self-care, but really it's like, stop looking at how do I do this and start looking at who can help me. Um, because that really frees up a lot of time and really, you know, and, and you only have time or money. So in the beginning, it may not be that you have money. So you have to have the time to do these things yourselves. But as you start bringing in money, start looking at, okay, what is the thing? You know, I always like to look at what do I love doing in my business? What do I never have time to do? And what do I hate to do? The first thing I'm going to do is take the things that I hate to do and try to find someone who can help me. That's going to open up more time to now look at the things that I don't have time for. And if that's still an issue, I start delegating those things out too. And then a really cool lesson that I learned this year, because I was really struggling with how to fit in ceremony and spirituality into the busyness of my life. And I just learned this, but it was to start turning what I'm already doing into ceremony. So I was trying to be, I was almost making it like an extra trip to the gym or something. And it was like, I dreaded it. Cause it's like, Oh, now I got to go sit down and meditate and pull a card and do all of these things. Whereas I realized I can actually, while I'm making a cup of cacao in the morning, I can put on some songs and listen to that. That puts me in a good mood. And while it's heating up, I can pull my card. It's things that I'm already doing. So I think that's really important too, when it comes to self-care is to try to fit in these things into what you're already doing versus trying to make it another task in your day. So the delegation really frees things up and then turning in just these little things of like, before you take a sip of that coffee or cacao is just like, have a gratitude moment or set an intention for what you want your day to look like and just kind of, or check in with yourself. What am I feeling today? How am I feeling? You know, and then ask yourself what you need and maybe redirect your day. I feel like all of that is really a form of taking care of yourself beyond just a bubble bath or a pedicure, which I love those things too. I definitely find time for them. Um, but I think it doesn't have to be this grandiose kind of act that a lot of times we put that pressure on ourselves. Yeah, I feel like what you're talking about, babe, is living mindfully, like making your daily life a meditation, a moving meditation of being present in all acts and all things. So I love that you had that epiphany and realization of like, oh my gosh, I can bring intention to this daily act that I'm drinking my tea or whatever the case may be. Or even, you know, Chris always talks about when we talk about the seven or above rule one of the examples I like to use is laundry. Like who wants to do laundry? Like, but how do we make it a seven or above? Chris always suggests to bring mindfulness into it and turn that daily ritual into 
a deeper meditation and an opportunity for you to drop in, to be present, to offer gratitude, even while you're doing those um, tasks that don't really, they're like, quote, mindless tasks. You can bring mindfulness by bringing that gratitude and tension, even though your physical body's I mean, it's, doing It's so cheating. <laughs> it's, it's literally cheating because when you do that, you realize you don't have to make time. You're already doing the task is that most of us just live on autopilot. And so we never feel really engaged in anything. That's why you always feel like, where's the next exciting thing? I've always gotten shit because I do the laundry and the dishes. And I do it like on, when we're on trips. If we come with friends, I'm like, hey, you may run your laundry real quick. And they're like, what? Like, what? I'm, it's my meditation time. While I'm doing that, I'm focusing on my breathing. I'm in with my thoughts. It's just very, very, no one's bothering you while you're doing laundry. It just doesn't happen. It's just, you're just there by yourself with your thoughts, nice and relaxed. And, it, and we can do that for everything that we do in life. I mean, you talking about delegation and how easy self-care can be is another one of those moments. It's like, yeah, boundary, yep, boundaries. Yep, yep, she's right. Yep, boundaries yep. is the hottest self-care you can do for yourself. Like eliminating energetic access to you as you realize, like we can't just be, giving and serving everyone all the time. We have to create space to serve ourselves, And I love that you're bringing more mindfulness into your every movement. It's so oh, important. I always loved you, Kelly. Oh, <laughs> well, I love you guys. Thank you. <laughs> so what does the next year look like for you? For someone who lives that moment to moment, feels what's right, there's got to be some level of trajectory that you have like this feeling of like, for me, I don't know what or how it looks, but I am, the salon is, we are letting go of the salon this year, like no more association of any sort. So it's like, I don't know what and how I'll get there and feel it out when it, the time comes, kind of general idea. So do you have a general trajectory of where you want to go and what you want to mindfully craft for yourself this year? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I feel like last year was so much of that, that just like grind, 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 get the product offer, the suite, everything together. And I feel like it's where I want it. So this year's trajectory is really just focusing on automating as mo much of it as possible, um, putting it on auto, getting it in the funnels, um, you know, and the goal for me is really to kind of double what I'm doing in the coaching business, because my goal is to, you know, work from anywhere. And so I love my brick and mortar business. I'm going to see that through as long as it will have me. Um, but, you know, I am working towards having more of this fluidity in my schedule and really just, um, you know, taking that time to kind of enjoy the the fruit of all the labor over the last 14 years, because I've been at this for a little while now with the business. And um, yeah, at this point, it's more almost like I want to slow down so I can speed up a little bit. Mm, relax and receive. Yeah, it's like, the, it's like you find the real gift. I, I feel like the gift that you get on the business journey is discovering yourself and the fact that you can do it. And then the gift that you get at the end of the business journey, besides extra dollar, extra jingle in your pocket, is just that like, oh, it's just nice to relax for a minute. We're just going to sit back and take a couple breathers. And I feel like it's so important for people to remember both parts of that journey. It's not just that whole grind part, but it's that part where after you've done that, you take a pause and you say, I've done great work. Let's automate a little bit of this. Let's make a little bit more of this a little easier. Let's let's shave off 30% of the work that I'm having to do. And like during that time, let me just enjoy things. Let me go spend time with people that I love, care about, you know, go to museums, just do things I normally wouldn't do in the middle of the day on a Tuesday. You know, it's just like, let me have a little bit of life. It's so when we get to do things like that, those are the moments where I actually feel rich. Or like you feel like, damn, that, that, this is a rich life. Because I'm in a moment, right? I've got time to talk to our neighbor. Neighbor's out there. He's going through a moment. I'm going to sit down with him. I'm okay, right? Let's just sit here for 30 minutes. You know, crack open a beer. Real quick. I don't even drink beer. I'll crack one open with you. Listen to your stories. It's like a different part of life because you start to realize that those moments are the ones that have a lot of this, the money in them, the real money of life, the real juice and nectar comes from that part. Then you can't find it anywhere else. It just, they spontaneously happen. I can't plan for them. They're just there, but only if I have the downtime to actually make them exist. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that I really worked on this year, last year, you know, I kept working with, you know, coaches and therapists and things like this. And I just kept saying, I don't understand. I'm so grateful. I, I am grateful every single day, but it just didn't feel right. And she challenged me and said, what about contentment? Because you are grateful for everything, but when are you just content with where you're at? And that was such a pivotal moment for me because I stepped back and I looked and I'm like, could I have more? Yes, we could all have more, you know, but it's like, I'm, I'm happy with my house. I'm content with it. I'm content with my car. I'm content with my business. I'm content. I'm content. I'm content. I'm content. And when you finally separate out having just gratitude for true contentment with where you're at, 
that's where you can step back and let life just kind of happen and be present versus forcing it all the time. And that doesn't mean I don't want to grow. I want more. I, I always want more and everybody does, but I want more for the hell of it at this point, you know, not because I feel like I have to keep up with anybody or have more or be better. It's like, no, I'm very happy with where I'm at. Now I just want it for the hell of it so that I can enjoy it. Yeah. I feel like once you hit contentment, that's exactly when life throws a curveball. It's like, oh, okay, well, I'm so glad that you don't feel like you need more. Let me bring you more. And then you have to adjust to that expansion. You know, you're like, oh, well, I was good. This was great. Like, oh gosh, there's so many deep spiritual nuggets in what yeah. you just said. Yeah. I feel like we could unpack that so deeply, but it, it kind of reminds me of the time where it's twofold, right? It's like, live as if you wanted that thing now. So like, if you don't have the dream life that you've always wanted, like what is stopping you from bringing that attitude and energy into this present moment right now? And then the other side of that coin is, but what if you were just like good with everything as it is. And the second you accept, that's when we stop resisting our future. And when we stop resisting, we become a magnet for it's like automatic change. And so it's, it, there's like this beautiful, everything has two sides, right? Of the sword of the coin. There's always that shadow and light side. And I feel like, um, we work so hard to like, want to get somewhere, but then once we just relax and notice that there is nowhere to be, but here, then that's when everything starts to expand. The, the, there's a saying in enlightenment, like before enlightenment, I chopped wood after enlightenment, I chopped wood. It's like the same, you're doing the same shit. It's just a whole new perspective of presence that you bring to this moment. Oh, so good. Hell yeah. Oh, where do we go from here, Miss Kelly? Like what book are you reading? What's the thing like jazzing you up, lighting you up in this moment right now? Yeah. Funny enough, the book I've been reading, I just picked up for our friend Misty. Um, it's called Don't Make It Weird. And it's how to show up as a human being and an entrepreneur on the internet, because I think there's so many rules out there now that are like, you must do this, you must do this and this and this. And it's like, you know, don't, don't make it weird. Just be you. You are what people, you know, want to get to know, like, and trust. And um, so it's a really fun read. She's very sarcastic and fun. I really like it, but that's more about, for me, it's like showing up at this point more authentically and not trying to be what everyone puts you in a box of what it's supposed to look like to be an entrepreneur, whether it's in person or online. So that's, that's kind of what I'm doing now. I think that must be the theme of today because earlier I had a podcast with Jody Brown and that was the the topic of conversation is like, I've been in this online industry, like funnels game for well over 10 years and I've tried all the proven methods, right? But it was when I did my method, like the Brittany Carmichael feels best to do it this way is that's when I feel like it's the most fun. It's the most abundant. It's the most everything good about it. And then when I try to like force my way to do it, like as other people say you should, because this is how we did our seven figure launches. It's just like trying to put a star in a square shaped box. It just doesn't fit. So I love that you bring up showing up authentically, doing it in a way that feels good for you. And I think that's what comes across, like the passion behind what you're sharing and your authenticity is going to be the superpower moving forward. So I love that you're shining your light, just really coming into your own. It's been really cool. Even just in the time that I've gotten to know you, it's seeing you settle more and more comfortable into your authentic own skin. And I, I love it. I'm here for it, babe. Oh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So where can people come soak up more of your magic and wisdom? Yeah, I hang out most of the time on Instagram. I've got my website too, if you're just looking for information, but come say hi to me on Instagram. I actually run it. I love to be in the DMs and talk to people. So um, if you ever have questions or want to connect or, you know, it can be anything, it can be business, personal development, any of the tools that I've done or people that I know and love. Um, I love sharing. I believe in helping others. So um, yeah, come over there and say hi and you can see everything that I'm up to. And you have some incredible free resources that you offer. So we're going to link all of that in the show notes so that everyone can check out your book, your freebies on how to start figuring out your profits and scale yourself. So if numbers have been a scary thing for you, Kelly's going to share her free resource. And do you want to share a little bit about that? Like what they're getting themselves into? <laughs> yeah, this is actually a new freebie, which I'm so excited about. It's so elevated, elevated. Um, it's called profitable percentages and it does kind of go back through it. It, it was um, born from the presentation that I did that you guys got to see. And um, so it starts with that terminology of just being familiar and then how to calculate certain terms. And then 
what is a standard percentage rule for the money that's coming into your business um, and how to allocate that. But what I love is that it's flexible and I teach you that too. So I give you a standard guideline, but then you can play with it to make it your own. Um, and there's a masterclass that goes along with it to kind of walk you through. So it's a very, very exciting freebie. Um, lots of valuable information to get you on the right track with your finances. Yeah, if you are a business owner, go get this because I cannot tell you how much, even if it just opens up a conversation, even if you just start talking about this kind of stuff, you'll see so much in the bottom line of what can really happen. Go get it immediately. Yeah, yeah. absolutely valuable stuff. Every time you share, teach, or show up, it just brings so much passion and energy, which is why we wanted to showcase your wisdom here on The Elevated Life. And to close out today's conversation, we always love to end it by asking, what does living an elevated life mean to you? Yeah, you know, I believe like we've already said is like living with intention and like living in your purpose and finding what that looks like. So, um, you know, I think a lot of times we look at elevated in a financial way, but for me, it's more about like what you're doing with your time and who you're spending it with um, and how much joy that's bringing to your daily life. Well, thank you for spending your time with us here. We're clearly a seven or above in her book. It's been so <laughs> incredible to hang out with you today. Y'all go check out Kelly's beautiful website, information, freebies, all the things she does is gold. And we can't wait for you to soak up her wisdom. Until then, we will catch you next time. Peace. Peace.